I think the big key to happiness, and many people have emphasized this, and of course it's ancient wisdom, like Aristotle emphasized this, is to think less of yourself. We've thrown ourselves into a community, for example, reaching out to people and being involved in groups. People share their feelings about grief now, working on water safety. That makes a big difference because you're not, the self is a bottomless pit. We could spiral down and really stay down. But I think like looking past yourself, I mean, that's kind of what I learned from him, really. That was his unique quality way he could connect with people. Like Irish Alzheimer's, where you only remember the grudges. Yeah. He was able to put that past him. Like at each moment, he would look for a way to connect with someone, not because he needed to be liked, but it was just his instinct to make that moment a positive one. And that really helps you navigate difficult circumstances. Hello, everyone. This is Chris and Liz. We are a brother sister team. And on behalf of the Charco Marie Tooth Association, a.k.a. CMTA, we are coming at you, folks. Coming at you. <laughs> wow. It gets louder each okay. time. Coming at you from Costi Post. I am Chris's personal assistant. I live in California. And Chris is in Vermont, but I can do all that from right here in California. Exactly. And this is another episode of our podcast name, what, Lizzo? CMT for me, CMT, the number four, me. That's right, folks. CMT for me, a community-focused podcast dedicated to those with CMT, giving them a voice in the community to share their ideas, good or bad, and their stories, successes, challenges, and much, much more. Yeah, we have such a fantastic community and talking about the community. So Laurel gave me a call, Laurel Richardson, she's oh, yeah. our community invest. How's she so doing? I have a little advertisement here or something to tell the community. All right. Okay, you ready? Ready. Okay. Rip. So the CMT is calling all healthcare professionals to attend an incredible day of education at the CMT Clinical Summit on April 21st. That's April 21st, 2023. Cool. Courses will be available in CMT surgery, physical therapy, occupational therapy, neurology, pulmonology, and so much more. So if you are a healthcare professional, Register. And if you're a community member, encourage your healthcare team to attend the summit so that they can best help you treat you and other patients with CMT. So, nice. continuing education credits are available, and registration is open at summit.cmtausa.org. Sounds like a fantastic opportunity. It does. It does. Those clinical summits are exceptional. So, place it on your calendar, folks, April 21st. I think it's so, Lizzo. <laughs> is it? Yeah. Well, okay. Well, that's all right. Better late than never. So, Lizzo, let's get into the details. Quick question: Do you remember Stretch Armstrong? Stretch wasn't it that toy that you and Anthony used to use? Oh yeah, remember Stretch Armstrong was that man filled with gel, and you could stretch him. He only stood maybe like two feet high, and. Anthony and I would stretch him like six feet and then he'd just rip and all this gel would come out and they gave you these little <laughs> tiny band-aids you could put on to repair him. Oh my God. Was this him? Oh yeah. Yeah, that was him. Exactly. Yeah. That was awesome. Wait, Love that guy. Why in the heck are we talking about? All right. Well, listen, stretch. let me tell you like, why this is important. And from my perspective, stretching is so important as you will hear from our upcoming guest speaker. Do you stretch Lizzo? Oh, I stretch daily, all the time. What type of stretches do you do? Oh, are you quizzing me now? Yeah. Yeah, so I Because I, I don't actually know if you do it. I think you're just you saying... Know, half the stretches, side. foot stretches, my toes, I have foot problems, oh. I have hamstrings, quads, upper body, stretch okay. all the time, fingers. Jeez. All right, I'm a going? believer. <laughs> my goodness. I try to stretch each day. My you legs, do. shoulders, arms, et cetera. I'm not a pro. However, I should build this into my daily routine. It gets tough. I just have to remind myself. But, but don't be you do careful, something? Lizzie. Don't you don't you do something every morning, like two or three minutes of some yeah, some yeah stretching? Thing? But it could be better. But I've missed the last couple of days, so I got to put that on my uh, mental calendar here to continue. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So listen, with that in mind, Lizzo, why don't you introduce our new guest? Tell us a little bit about him. Jeff Seitzer. He's a writer. He's cool. a teacher. And stay at home dad. And Jeff, I think you're still a stay at home dad with Penelope, right? Yes, I am. 
Okay. So he wrote a book, The Fun Master, A Father's Journey of Loss, Love, and Learning to Live One Day at a Time. I read it. I love the book. It's a tragic book with an inspirational core, right? It's an inspirational meaning and you've gotten a lot out of it. So we're talking about stretching because Jeff is a big stretcher. <laughs> he stretches right. all the time and Jeff has CMT. So welcome Jeff to our yes. CMT for me. Thank you for joining us, Jeff. Delighted to be here. Awesome. Awesome. And I'll tell you folks, we did a pre-interview with Jeff and I was very inspired after hearing his stories and he will have a lot more to say. So Lizzo? Yeah, well, I want to know more about Jeff. Yeah. So Jeff, who are you? Where do you live? Tell us about yourself. Give us your history. Yeah, I, I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, and then settled in Chicago. I went to graduate school here, and my wife and I decided that this is where we really want to make our home. So I've lived here for 30-some years. Part of the time, we've spent overseas in England and Germany, but now we're pretty much settled here. I teach at Loyola University in Chicago and also Roosevelt University. And as, as Elizabeth mentioned, I'm still a stay-at-home dad. I have a teenage daughter in high school. Oh, and she's a teenager. Penelope's yeah. a teenager. Oh, I she thought she was younger. She's a teenager, yes, very much so. And the fact is, people think that when your kids get older, it gets easier. It doesn't. It's just a little bit different and exactly. requires different skills. So I'm learning those and still adapting and just finding my life very enjoyable. She's on the rowing team, which is kind of a secret society people don't know about. But once you become uh -huh. part of it, it's kind of like this this cult, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. We're mo moving into the season. It's very engaging and uh, tiring and exciting at the same time. So nice. very active, rich life. That's yeah. awesome. what, do you, what do you teach? I teach philosophy and religion. Okay. Uh, yeah. So at Loyola, I teach a class called Loyola Mission, which is kind of about how the Jesuit understanding of education. It's not an education class. I teach mm -hmm. it as kind of like a kind of a Jesuit philosophy of happiness class. Wow. Uh, oh, nice. Kind of about happiness and how to attain happiness. And then I teach world religions at Roosevelt University. And this fall, I might go back to my love, which is teaching political philosophy. That's what my training was in. Okay. Oh, my gosh. All those subjects you just mentioned, I didn't take any of them in college, especially the philosophy one. Oh yes. And if she did, she may not have passed them. But... <laughs> no, Elizabeth did very well in college, so. but not in those subjects. Not in those subjects. Yeah. So, yeah. Jeff, you have CMT, but it's mild. It's CMTX, and men are usually affected more than women. And you went to see Dr. Shai and everything. So tell me how your CMT is affecting you today. And you have some beliefs, a belief system about how to manage CMT, and I think that would be very valuable for our community members. Yeah, I'm not sure that I believe in reincarnation or not, but I believe I've lived about three or four lives with CMT so far. Mm. And meeting Dr. Shai was a a big moment in this history because he confirmed absolutely that I had CMT because I was diagnosed with it at 13 and uh, wore braces on my legs. And then in my late twenties, another neurologist said, well, I'm not even sure you have it. And then I finally got a blood test because we had a child and we thought, well, we should see if maybe he could get it for me. Sure. And he didn't have it because it's X based trait, but I did. And it's type one. And I was kind of shocked because I've been told before that my symptoms are very mild. And they are, but it's kind of an unusual circumstance in that my left side is very mild. I have very few problems with my left side. And my le right side is terrible. Isn't it's that like interesting? Bad. So I kind of feel like it's the tale of two sides, right. the tale of two cities, in that my right side is kind of what CMT should be like for someone my age with CMTX. Okay. Um, you don't. They don't go to neutral, even though I've had surgeries and I wear all sorts of orthotics on my right leg. And it, it's just, I have bad, really bad sore spots and it kind of affects my gait now. It didn't so much before. So I'm kind of like half and half. I do pretty well, but I have to really work very hard to, to, to maintain that. I'm kind mm -hmm. of my own personal chiropractor. I'm constantly sure. adjusting my routines to kind of get at certain problem areas and stretching, for example, I've realized that if I don't stretch my upper body regularly too, then the rest of my body gets out of whack. Mm -hmm. So CMT kind of does play a large role in my life. I spend a lot of time adapting to it, but I find that kind of has enriched my life too, though. Yeah. Tell us about that in terms of my well, life. I remember my wife and I was in my late thirties and I was doing some stretching and said, you're actually kind of doing yoga. And I'd kind mm -hmm. of heard of yoga before, but I'd never really done it before. I had just kind of developed all these stretching techniques because I would just go according to how I felt. 
like I could feel one part of my body wasn't quite working, wasn't in the right position. So I've spent this whole life trying different approaches to exercise and shoes, diet, because I also had encephalitis as a kid. Yeah, that's crazy. Like when you were four, right? Yeah, I had mumps and the mumps was so bad it, it produced encephalitis, which is swelling of the brain. So it's kind of like having a stroke. And it right. left all these residual effects. In fact, I, I wondered with Dr. Shai if perhaps my right side is because I was a little bit paralyzed from encephalitis when I was a kid. And he pointed out that it, they might actually be related, which was kind of something that was really startling in that people with CMTX, there's a, a particular protein involved with CMTX, and it's present in both the central and peripheral nervous systems. And some people with CMTX, if they have a metabolic shock, like they're, say, deep sea diving, they can have a central nervous system event like encephalitis or a stroke right. or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, as, as a kid, after encephalitis, I was left like a, I had super hyperactive, like enormous amounts of energy. And so I'd have to dispel this energy in order to just kind of concentrate it all. I mean, you know, as a kid, it's particularly hard because you're sitting in school. It's like prison. Just sit yeah, down. all day. My right. leg would be shaking. And the teacher's like, you have to stop that. It's like, I would love to stop it. You, know, yeah, you can't do it. But like, nonetheless, it was really difficult. So, but at the same time, that kind of needing to adapt to encephalitis really helped me with CMT because I, I'm so active. But then at the same time, you have to be really careful how you're active yeah. because you're going to wear down your joints and your legs, you know? Right. So I became much more scientific, not right away. I mean, I'm portraying this as though I was like the, some genius at like eight or I figured like it all. Well, you, kind of, I mean, yeah. just, you, you look back at it and you see that you're learning. It's kind of like in the the, the, the movie, The Karate Kid, where he's in, paint the fence. He's doing it over and over again. And eventually, he's got to <laughs> right. move instinctively. So this is all kind of happening like just on the fly. But over many years, you see, you look back and you see, well, this was actually helping me become a really disciplined person in a yeah. certain way. I'm super disciplined. You know, I like the parties and I drink and all sorts of things where I'm not disciplined. But like when it comes to managing my, neurological problems, I am more disciplined. Wow. But that's a great way of looking at it, right? That's an awesome perspective. Yeah. You don't know how Maybe many people with CMT would love to have your energy. Exactly. My son has 1A and he's exhausted all the time and oh, he takes yeah. medication just to stay awake. And I'm kind of envious of your energy. And I wonder if you could do a blood transfusion or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know my my wife gets B twelve shots every other week. I so I wish I could just give you or you just take a bite out of me, you'd be fine. <laughs> no, right. uh, my, my B twelve levels are always well now at sixty four. They're twice the normal level. So when I was like yeah, forty, huh? really young, it was just crazy. It was really right. hard. I'd have to exercise for a couple hours just to kind of sit down and study. Yes. When were you wearing leg braces? Uh, did you reference that was as a child when you were in school? Yeah. Well, my mom goes and, watching. And how did that come about? Yeah. Yeah, she had very, her symptoms were much worse and my grandfather's were much worse. So she was watching all of us and there was no blood test then or anything like that. So I was diagnosed with CMT and she took me to an orthopedic guy. And as you know, I've learned this from my dealings with the medical profession, not a criticism of them at all, but you know, to a hammer, everything's a nail, right? And so yes. everybody has a specialty. He's an orthopedic guy. He puts people in braces. Mm-hmm. So he immediately proposed that. And they were really terrible. Were they metal braces? <laughs> well, they were metal braces. I show up in junior high, the most self-conscious. Oh, my God. Exactly, the you know, time. From yeah. one day to the next, here I am in junior high with these braces. You had, like, little heels. They had little, like, pads on the bottom where you could see them. They had a joint that would squeak sometimes. And the irony is I was super athletic and strong and energetic. But I'm looking at my mother and my grandfather. I'm like, oh my God, I don't want to become like them. I mean, yeah, like, sure. I didn't these braces, I'd be in a wheelchair. You uh, didn't so. really need those braces at that time, did you? That's that's the thing. That's that what I was recalling. <laughs> yeah. No, that's the terrible thing. I mean, I, I applied for the Peace Corps after college and I put down, I have shark or marine tooth disease. They thought it was a dental disease. And I yeah. couldn't convince them that my teeth were fine. But it would have been a good thing if I had gone because the braces probably would have broken and I would have just had to go without them. That's why when I was later, as at the University of Chicago, well, I had these plastic braces by then that were recommended by a shoe salesman. He was 19 years old. He <laughs> said, you know, they have, they have better braces now. Maybe you should try. Why didn't I know? Why didn't my orthopedic guy tell me that? Yeah. So at any rate, 27, they did a test and they said, well, I'm not even sure you have CMT, but you shouldn't certainly be wearing the braces. Oh it was like, poor guy. I just about blew up. I wasn't angry, but I was just like, you mean I never should have been wearing these braces? Because like, it was really hard to wear them. I mean, psychologically. I would have been angry. 
I mean, I would have been angry. Those that's a, like a stigma. I got to deal with it. And you didn't even really need them at that point. Yeah. I, I didn't need them from the age of 13. You're probably been better mm-hmm. than Adam. He said that was kind of like really hard to take, but oh. it also illustrates that I'm kind of like about 15 years behind every wave. Like I have a company <laughs> now called the noodle. That's a fabulous yeah. thing. That would have been great if I had that. It's not very obtrusive and it's great for your feet. Yeah. Uh, the noodle. Wait, what is the noodle? It's, it's, it's a brace called the noodle. I don't know why they call it. Yeah, it, it is a noodle. brace, but yeah, yeah. I'm curious. Well, I can show you. I'm wearing it right now. Oh, yeah. yeah, let's see. yeah let's see I don't it. know why I'm wearing it. I don't really need it right now, but there it is right there. Well, you're pretty flexible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know. I am super flexible. Yeah, Lizzo, you try to do that. <laughs> yeah. You're going to fall like over that. in her chair and land on the floor there. So you try to do right, it. Like, that has a strap on it that this guy developed when <laughs> I was at the CMT clinic was in Detroit. That was really a great idea because my right leg kind of angles out more. Nonetheless, I'm saying like it developed long after I could have made use of it when I was younger. But How does your so, CMT affect your daily life now? It, it, it's generally fine. I mean, certain things make it really difficult, like travel, because yeah. I have so much footwear. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I hear you. You have a, a whole, do you have a trunk full of shoes? Yeah, different shoes, orthotics for every event. And and you have to plan a lot. Like, you know, we go on these regattas and I'm like, okay, what am I going to bring with me to the site? We have to change from time to time. You can't, I can't wear the noodle for a super long time. I don't think it's good for me, but then I have to have something else to change into. I do have to plan my exercise. I mean, I do, I train a lot and that's kind of hard that's to good. fit in the day. Like this week, I take my daughter to rowing practice like 4.30 in the morning, and I would come home and I'd start my day really early. But lately, I've been crawling back into bed and sleeping, and that's great. But then it shortens my day. It's hard to fit exercise in. So I have to do a lot of planning over exercise, like, you know, mm-hmm. what I do on particular days. And and you mentioned stretching. Like I, I should stretch like a half hour every day, but on my swimming days, I tend to let it go because it's just, it's just so tedious to do. Mm-hmm. Time takes too long. So it takes a lot of planning and execution is kind of hard. But if I do that, then I do pretty well. I and I know you do a lot of cooking, Jeff. Does yeah. that does the CMT affect your ability to use a knife for cooking and cutting? I mean, your with your hands? Yeah. I mean, well, yeah, I actually got the fingers. message from Dr. Shai about two years ago where he said, well, with your type, the hands start to go and it starts with the thumb. The thumb is super important. Like, I'm a golfer. And I noticed oh, yeah. my thumb was slipping a little bit. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. But for the most part, I'm able to do things really well. Like my hands work really well. Of course, I started to work on them too. And it's like just more to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Another just one part. more exercise, right? Or like, one more stretching exercise. I forgot my little thumb, my little right. finger splints, for example, sometimes. You know? yeah. do you, well, you, you know what? them on when you sleep? Well, it's more of these little things here, like the, these things have my, my knuckles here. My fingers kind of. Oh, right. Uh-huh. And these so help them stop curling. Exactly. Let me right. see when you put it on what it looks like. Yeah. So he's putting this little finger brace oh. on. <laughs> Drop finger there. splints that's that you just dropped. We'll just stick it oh, on there like that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's it. That's a huge thing. But you know, so yeah. you have to keep remember it and when to put it right. on. And you go to parties and you're talking to somebody. I was just in a meeting for this and I noticed like I have my th- finger splints on. <laughs> 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 no, but like there it is. It's just it's so much to keep track of. Well, Jeff, you're so active. I mean, I even saw a picture. I think you're on a bicycle. Yeah. You just said you swim, you play golf, you stretch. I mean, you've got a you've got a really busy day in life, but it sounds like that has really helped you manage your CMT. It's incredible. Well, we know now from I teach philosophy of happiness and how important exercise is for people's well being. Does help you keep a positive attitude, I think. Perhaps you, you feel this way. I don't know. But I kind of lean into the pain kind of. I have a pain. I've learned that I really have to kind of like go at it, maybe exercise even more, which is a tough thing to do. So as it you is. said before, I'm, I'm grateful that I have this energy. Sometimes I curse it, but but it does help me deal with possible depression. I can see how people can mm-hmm. be very depressed. I mean, not being mm-hmm. able to move well. Yeah, absolutely. Really you know? so yeah, your life has been pretty challenging. And you wrote about this in the book. And I loved your book, by the way, it's right here, The Fun Master. If you available, you, you can purchase that on Amazon. It's even Kindle version, right? Yep. I want you to talk about the book and why you wrote the book. Right. 
Yeah, yeah well, and, and I think on that, Jeff, too, cover, I'm curious just in terms of the title as well, well how you came well, up with the title. But let's spend some time on that book and, and okay. what drove you to write that, et cetera. So if you could explain yeah. that to our listeners. Well, you know, when my wife was expecting, she's a librarian, and so she kind of reads everything. So she was fully informed about pregnancy. And she would share her findings with me at night, and I would kind of feign interest. That I would be reading philosophy or something. I think to myself, why would you be so worried about something as simple as parenting? People have been doing it forever. But then our son is born with all these internal organ defects, serious ones. And I spent the, you know, she stayed back at the maternity hospital because she was exhausted. And I went and spent the first day at the other hospital with him. He was there for his first surgery. And right before his first surgery, we shared this kind of special moment, which is described in the book, where there's some kind of crazy, but I felt like he, he chose me to be his caregiver mm-hmm. and talk about a terrible HR choice because I was kind of a special needs adult myself. Oh, you know, Jeff, you're so much fun. And I thought the title might be you. And I'm like, really? But I don't think fun he's master. Really what a great dad. He's on the floor. He's like playing. He's like coming up games, water, like he's sorting water on everybody. I mean, he, he's a kid himself. Yeah. Well, it was true that I could throw myself into it. Like I kind of loved just goofing around. And I think I was set up well to be his parent in a way because managing CMT encephalitis, I'd really learned to balance a lot of different things. Like he had a lot of medical care and appointments and things like that, but we always squeezed in a lot of fun in there. And it turns out, I have full disclosure, I, I, I'm not the fun master, but you have to read the book to figure out who is. Right. Uh, I was set up well for that, but at first it was a real challenge because I, I thought I had to control every moment of my day just to cope. And I was also kind of self-centered, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I wanted to continue my studies and my yeah. friends and writing scholarly books, et cetera. But then I kind of took over his care and it was really hard at first. Right? Oh, it was they, hard. You were I'm at the sure. hospital all the time. His name is Ethan, by the his way. His name is right? Ethan. But he had a kind of a wonderful quality. I mean, he had this kind of calm, calmness, and he had a great sense of fun. And he really kind of he really kind of helped me calm down and focus. And then over time, like I felt like he was my teacher about life. Because he naturally lived in the moment. And this is what you learn about kids like who have like major health challenges and people with CMT or perhaps this way can be described this way as well, that they don't have time for self-pity, right? I mean, they want to live their lives fully. I remember once I got on the elevator at the hospital when I was a, a volunteer and there were these two little girls they are like 10 years old and they're just hospital gowns on and their heads were shaven and they'd had like these big zipper scars on their heads. And with mm-hmm. like that kind of that brownish stuff they put on there for antiseptic or whatever. And they were chatting away and giggling and just having the greatest time. And I thought they are not going to let life get away from them. And I had these experiences over and over and over again at the hospital. And I thought, this is really inspiring. And how can I be have so much self-pity for myself when I'm around someone like this who doesn't have a moment of energy? For that, like for him, he ended up having hearing loss because he had this really serious heart surgery. And he just kind of saw his hearing loss as kind of like more of a practical problem. Like he didn't feel like he was inferior because of it, but it just required him to adapt a little bit. And he actually made it, it was kind of interesting watching him because he had enormous ability to connect with people. And I think his hearing loss kind of helped him with that because we would sit and talk about it. Like he would ask me, well, why is this guy saying that with that sort of expression? And I would kind of explain it to him so he could like yeah. kind of understand what people were saying to him and gain the situation and how to respond. And so he kind of turned a, a frown upside down. All of the things that he, he, he had challenges he had were opportunities. You know, and if, and Jeff, he, he has so many challenges and as parents, and I know what it's like to be in, not at this level, but to be at doctor's offices all the time, but he had to have yeah. his esophagus stretched. And then if he had a cold and it was very, I mean, these aren't just small challenges. They were huge, life threatening challenges. His yeah, whole, major, he, right. yeah, his whole time he was alive. Right. Yeah. I mean, he got he got quite into it midway through his life, his short life, like 10 years. He was starting to come through a lot of that. And that was really great. He was really thriving. And that's the time of period that I started to kind of assimilate a lot of these lessons I'd learned. You know, I really became aware of how kind of much wiser he was than me. So yeah. what did you learn? It's a great reference yeah. that you said he was a teacher, right? You, you felt yeah. like he was your teacher. 
Well, I think if you really pay attention to kids, I think they're all this way to a degree Mm -hmm. because they bring things out. They make you aware of things about yourself that you need to change. He really helped me with that a lot. But I, I even realized that lately, like I, like I show love through problem solving, like I try to help people. And so if my kids had a, a problem or a challenge, I would try and change it. Of course, lots of times, like my daughter's a teenager now, she just wants you to kind of listen. And that required me to change my outlook entirely. And so I, I'm yeah. kind of grateful for that. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. And, and Jeff, so tell us just the backstory of the reason in terms of why you wrote this book and what. Yeah, well, it, yeah, it's kind of like a little, it's, it's kind of hard to believe in a way, but Ethan was swimming with me in Lake Michigan and, and he drowned, right? We got cast into this area of extreme turbulence, uh, which I understand a lot better now that I'm working on water safety, the cause of water safety, but we were overwhelmed very quickly. And before I knew it, we were sinking together, you know, and I'm desperately trying to get him to the surface, looking up at this disc of light on the surface and trying to get there. And my arms and legs give out. And I look down at him, this beautiful hair in the water and the the sun was coming in through his hair. And I just, I thought we were going to die together. I certainly were going to die together. And my last thought before blacking out was, I won't be able to tell his story. And this was kind of an odd thought, perhaps, the last story I, particularly since I was not planning to tell a story. I, mean, I had all these notes because my mother-in-law thought my stories were funny about my misadventures and that one day I might publish them. But he didn't really like to be the center of attention. Like as he described it, he said, some people need to be the main character, but not me. And so he was about connection, not like dominance or like being better than other people. But nonetheless, I had all these notes, you know, and so I, I felt like I kind of needed to write the book, you know, it was kind of like my duty. But I also realized writing it that it, it kind of kept me alive, really. I didn't have a lot of time to write it. It was like an hour or two every day. But it was kind of like you would come alive during that right. time. You were yeah. connecting yeah. to it. It was a yeah major connection. It was like channeling almost. Um, I, I really kind of had trouble stopping writing the book. First of all, because I had to write about the end and that was super hard, but also because it kind of felt like I was closing this chapter. So it kind of helped me through the worst stages of the grief of grief. And, yeah. and I, but at the same time, it felt like it it helped crystallize in my mind what it was he taught me. You know, and I came to believe that like we have something to learn from everyone, everyone you encounter. And writing is different than thinking. Like you think about something like, Oh, I got this all down and how it all, what it all means. But you don't. When you start to write it, it really forces you to like examine different circumstances and figure it out. And I feel like it really helped me figure out what he meant to me and, and what I learned from him and, and how I can kind of make him still in the world by being different myself. If yeah. I can be oh. more with him, which is a challenge for me because I was a lot different than him. Like I came through these negative experiences as a kid. And I was going to, it produced a negativity in me. I struggle against that. Mm-hmm. But you also had a lot of behavioral changes, right? Or just like you would get angry quickly. And you were, that was kind of a change since you were sick at four, right? Yeah. The, the, the various residual effects. One was extreme mood swings, like mm-hmm. out of the blue. Like I met someone in, in high school. This girl said, yeah, we grew up near your family. I remember you running down the street with all these adults chasing you. Because I would just hop up and run down and run for blocks and people are chasing me to have these, yeah. shifts, you know, my wife would notice it when I was older, when we were married, it's like something just comes over you when you're different. Your eyes are different. It's like yeah. the wave waves kind of go out of sync. It's, it was really a major problem and handling anger. You would just it swell up. Which I know now with my wife's going through menopause, it, it happens to women, you know, it's a surge up and then it kind of goes away. But like some you're worried about something happening and here you are taking care of a little kid as his own kind of challenges, serious challenges. It's like you're worried about, well, am I really up for this? But I, I, I think taking care of him helped me kind of figure that out somehow. I really haven't had any problems like that for a long time. Yeah. So, Jeff, I, I have a question here is yeah. the story that you just told. It's you told us this during the interview and seeing you in person, it makes me very emotional, right? Because I can't imagine that in the relationship that you had. I would imagine that there was a period of time after that tragedy that it was really, really challenging to the point where you could start writing. And I'm curious how you navigated through that period and how long that was. And then I'm also curious on 
did this situation have any, how did you and your wife work together? And I think about, was that a challenge as well? Were you separate? You know, it's it, sure it's hard to talk about. And just how did you guys manage through that as husband and wife? Well, that's a very good question because we were in various grief, grief groups for quite a while. Right. And lots of times people would be separated. Like yeah. they had a different style of grief. And I don't judge people or criticize them for their particular way they handle grief because, you know, it's their, they have their own kind of makeup and they follow their own use about what's the best thing to do. But fortunately, we had a very similar one. We both would openly share our feelings and we had a very rich community that kind of enveloped us and we would share our grief with them. And it was kind of interesting, being known as a grieving family and being willing to talk about it, people could share their grief. They were living in a secret life because as a grieving person, you're kind of expected to get over it. You are. Like a brave, yeah, a brave man swam out to try and save Ethan. I don't remember him at all. I was so far gone. But he, he'd he lost a daughter about two years before that. Oh. And after a year, his grief counselor said, him, you should really be over this by now. Oh. And so in our society, you're expected to be kind of over it. But people mostly just conceal it. It's still there. So that was kind of. Well, I don't want to say a nice thing and that you, you're not glad they have this grief, but like I was right. I was happy that they were willing to share it, you know, their spiritual experiences and how they cope with things. And so we were both kind of on the same page in that way. Now, we did have a daughter. She was three and a half. And we had to kind of change our approach. You know, like we had these big parties for the, the school when Ethan was younger that I described in the book. And we had one for her. Not It wasn't a party for her. It's just we would invite the, the preschool over for a big happy hour play date, people would think, oh, you must be over it now. It's like, no, we're just kind of doing our duty. So there was a certain kind of a role playing there. You had to make sure that she wasn't too affected by things while at the same time you're openly grieving. So that was very difficult to, to navigate that. Fortunately, we had each other and we, we still do. We kind of still share our grief and, and it, it changes over time. It's not like it goes away. It just kind of takes on different forms and different things remind you of it, certainly. But it was, Getting around to write the book was very difficult. I mean, right away, for example, I had 4,000 pages of notes of my time with him, but I could not call up a single memory of him for several weeks after he died. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there were a couple of breakthroughs. One was uh, I met the man who swam out the train saving them. My great fear was that I sacrificed him to save myself and that he died alone. And he told me that he had a fuller account of the of the drowning. And clearly I hadn't sacrificed him. He died in this man's arms trying to get back to shore. And the man, this man, Al Keating, he was drowning. He was drowning himself. He passed Ethan back to me and all three of us went under and he made it back to the surface. And my survival is still unexplained, right? I don't know. Jeff, do you think that your CMT had anything to do with your inability to save Ethan? I don't think so. I mean, I, you know, the thing about, I've learned about the lake, Lake Michigan and the the Great Lakes, is that the currents in the Great Lakes reach a speed of five miles per hour, which is more than two times, about two and a half times the top speed of an Olympic swimmer. Oh, So you're you're being a great, I mean, obviously being a great swimmer helps. Like two thirds of drowning victims are strong swimmers. We were just caught in several currents at the same time. The typical thing about a rip current as you know, if you live in California or on the East Coast, it's like you get them on their back and you get you follow it out and then you then you wait until you can get to the side. That didn't didn't work here because the waves were coming from both directions. Um, oh, okay. So so I don't know that that, that affected me because I was it's a very strong swimmer and I had lifeguard training. You know, I think we were caught in in overwhelming circumstances. In fact, someone came during the rescue attempt, a whole whole line of people, firemen, et cetera, in the water. They had life vests on, they had a line. And the waves were so strong, they knocked this young man off, the big guy, super strong, fully trained, off his line, and he almost drowned. Ethan's godmother had to go out and save him, pull him in. So I don't know that that affected me so much. The man who tried to save him was an enormous, strong guy. You know, in fact, it was reassuring yeah. to me when he showed up because he he showed up, came to our house, and like he kind of filled the doorway because right. I was afraid that maybe I wasn't strong enough to save him. You know, mm-hmm. and but I thought, well, no, because he's he's an enormous, strong person. And that was a long time. That was 12 years ago. So I was even stronger then. But nonetheless, I, I'm not sure that it, it did affect me. Okay. Yeah. So, so Jeff, I have a, I'm sorry, Chris. I just have a question on that. Yeah. Do you want to ask? Go ahead. No, go ahead. I just was wondering. This is the Lizzo podcast, by the no, way, it folks. Isn't. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go. You go. Nope. Okay. I have my question in reserve. Okay. Do you have any guilt about that whole day? And yes. if you do... 
how do you deal with it? Well, we have a lot of guilt in that. We weren't even going to go swimming that day. I, I know that. <laughs> yeah, we were sunburned and we we're going to do something else and people arrived. And this is kind of, it's kind of like a Greek tragedy, actually. That's kind of the way it's conceived in that we have the kind of fatal flaws uh, that end up being our undoing. And and it's it's not a bad thing. We value connection. So when people are there, it's hard for us to like turn away. They wanted to go swimming and Ethan was begging. Yeah. And my wife and I didn't have time to talk about safety precautions, like life fests and things like that. So we are guilty about that. We were off our game. We were off our game because we were generally careful parents. We weren't helicopter parents, but like I was always very careful about their safety. And we just hadn't had a chance to, to take account of that. Now, the fact is this part of the lake is particularly dangerous. Lake Michigan is the most dangerous of the Great Lakes in terms of currents, et cetera. So we weren't super well informed, which we're also a little bit guilty about. We've lived along the lake over 100 years combined. My wife grew up on the lake. We spent countless hours there. But, you know, the circumstances in this one part of the lake is or they aren't generally known. And yeah. so we're guilty about that. I mean, my wife, for example, we arrived at this cottage. And two days before we arrived, friends stayed in that cottage the week before. And they said, you know, there's a lot of mosquitoes here. So my wife, the librarian, looks up this great mosquito stuff that's completely environmentally friendly that you can just put on the ground. And it takes care of like mosquitoes, right? Yeah. That was delivered to the cottage. When we arrived and there it is. I mean, we're super informed about all sorts of things. She is. But nonetheless, we weren't that day. But you're usually not punished so terribly. It's no, like, no. People were all around us. I read a drowning account today where these two girls drowned. People were like a few feet away from them and they were okay. That's how kind of random it can be. And I'm not right. trying to excuse myself, but it's like. No, no, no. A terrible circumstance. I'm just kind of wondering how you it. rise above that. And weren't there oh, like well, 86 yeah. drownings that year? Yeah, there were a lot of drownings that year. It was kind of the beginning of an epidemic of drownings in the Great Lakes and Lake Michigan particularly. And But it is true. Like we do feel guilty. But a part about writing the book is it crystallizing what was really distinctive about him. I think other people can kind of learn a little bit from my experience with him. Yes. Yeah. Unique character. And so that helps a little bit with that. But the fact is, that's something that we will always bear with us, you know? it's just, right. uh, yeah. So, Jeff, just, just thinking about things such as the, this tragedy, grieving, your guilt, having CMT, and then the light at the end is here you are teaching how to obtain happiness. So <laughs> in those situations, how do you obtain happiness? What is the, the message there? And how, what's the path to get you there from your perspective? Well, I think the big key to happiness, and many people have emphasized this, and of course, it's ancient wisdom, like Aristotle emphasized this, is to think less of yourself, right? We've thrown ourselves into a community, for example, and, you know, reaching out to people and being involved in groups. People share their feelings about grief, for example, and now working on water safety. That makes a big difference because you're not, the self is a bottomless pit. We could spiral down and really stay down. But I think like looking past yourself, I mean, that's kind of what I learned from him, really. That was his unique quality way he could, could connect with people. Like Irish Alzheimer's, where you only remember the grudges. Yeah. He was able to put that past him. Like at each moment, he would look for a way to connect with someone, not because he needed to be liked, but it was just his instinct to make that moment a positive one. And that really helps you navigate difficult circumstances. Chance encounters are great. Like a, when you go shopping, for example, you really focus on being positive and maybe like letting someone go get in front of you to give them your spot, for example. And it really starts, it fills you with light. And, you know, research shows this really. It's very effective. And so like what you guys are doing with, with this podcast, it really helps people. Uh, oh, that, thank you. No, it really does. And that's the one thing about CMT today that I find really inspiring is that people are not alone. So we, we focus on that, like trying to maintain connections with people. And, and that takes work lots of times. Prior guests that we've had, I, I'm always intrigued by that in terms of there seems to be a kind of up and down cycle when someone is diagnosed with CMT and that reflection. And, like, and I think, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening to me. What am I going to do? Depression, et cetera. And then I'm always so impressed in terms of how they navigate through that. And what you said, I think is really important is thinking less of yourself and less focusing. Now you focus on yourself in terms of stretching and all of those oh, things, yeah. but you know, 
you have CMT, that's the deal. You can't change that. And you find ways to do other things. Yeah. You know, and giving no, back true. creates happiness for you. It's fantastic. Well, one thing that's really great about today is, I mean, there's always a certain amount of uncertainty with CMT or any sort of degenerative condition. But like when I was younger, there was so little information. Mm-hmm. I'd met the first person outside my family with CMT when I was 25. I'd never met anyone else. And I don't think that internet, you don't, you don't kind of turn to that because you want to engage in schadenfreude where you're glad to see someone else's suffering. Mm-hmm. But it helps you understand where you are in the world. Like the blog I follow, what, how people respond to each other. And there's great little snippets of advice, little things you can do that help relieve your pain and navigate new situations. And that's great for your happiness. That's very empowering. But it's very deflating. Like when I was younger, thinking I was just heading for a wheelchair, that's really deflating. Yeah. But, you know, you can gain this hope that, like, it's still going to be okay. And there's things that I can do. If that guy, like I watched a video once of a guy who was trying to open this thing of iced tea. His wife left and said, I want, what I want you to do is pour yourself an iced tea and get the ice, et cetera. It was like a re- huge challenge. I mean, it was kind of like climbing Mount Everest for, for someone without CMT. And he really did it with a, with real ch- good cheer, some spilling. I thought that's really inspiring doing little things and kind of expanding your universe, even in small ways is a great way to gain a, a little bit of happiness and feel like better about your place in the world, I think. Elizabeth, maybe we should maybe we should yeah. attend this class and sign up. <laughs> yeah, I know. I sent us the link. <laughs> I know, please. You have two new students right here. <laughs> yeah. But, Jeff, uh, did you even know you had C- you have CMT? Yeah, he did. I mean, I don't think yeah, he actually went to the he went to the CMT clinic with me oh, a couple did. of times in Detroit. Did he ever right talk to you about it? Ask you questions about it? Was he curious? I don't know. We never, we do, we talked about it a little bit, but he wasn't someone to dwell on stuff like that. I mean, for him, it's like, well, okay, your feet aren't that great. And, and that was when I first started to get orthotics, which were very helpful, but kind of people started to notice them and wonder about them. But for him, someone who wears hearing aids, for example, he just was kind of like, well, that's just what you need. Like when he first talked to us about hearing loss, you're kind of dreading this question. Why did God make some children who need hearing aids? And we're like, oh God, it's a tough right. one. We said, well, some people need help with seeing, so they wear glasses. And so for him, it's like, okay, you need you need a little bit of help with that. But he was a naturally accepting person. That, that but was do nice. you think you downplayed your CMT because of all of Ethan's struggles? I did have to make it less of a focus in my life. You know, there were yeah. days that Same question. didn't work. Like I spent a huge amount of time in the hospital I yeah. was and for like six hours. Which right? must have been incredibly difficult for you, right? <laughs> yeah, that was, that was really difficult, you know, and I worked very hard not to like show that. I, I don't have a great poker face when I'm in pain or something's upsetting me. Yeah. I had to develop one because I didn't want that to become the focus of our relationship. He would still be understanding, I think, if if I were in pain, but we just kind of hobble around, you know, we make our way around the neighborhood. and. I didn't have good equipment then. That was too bad. I wish I had the, 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 the toolkit that I have now. Yeah. I have, I have a great toolkit. Very grateful for that. Boy, I mean, we could talk for hours and hours. With but what if we all want to know what's in that toolkit? Yeah. Then, what is in the toolkit? Yeah, well, I, like, I want to know what's in there. And can you like replicate that and give me it for Christmas? <laughs> well, I actually have one thing that's really intriguing is people have been asking on the blog about traveling, like car travel. And that's really hard when you're sitting there. And your feet kind of are starting to fold under, et cetera. And I have this thing called little kicks. And they're really, they're designed for little kids, right? And they're hard plastic thing, kind of an SMO. And uh, I got them like a long, quite a while ago. I don't wear them for anything else other than when I'm driving in the car or that I'm like using, I have a home gym. So I got like an extra cycle and a rowing machine. I put them on then. And it's really great for these purposes. I can't walk in them at all. They are terrible for me in terms of walking. But if I'm taking a long walk, I've got my noodle, right? Yeah. And then I've got these. Yeah. And then I have what I call my flats, which are the in the sole, in the shoe orthotics. And those are really life-changing. This is something that people in the CMT community perhaps already know, but I listening to like various broadcasts, et cetera, and watching the blog, I, I think they may not know that like all orthotics guys are not created equal. 
Some of them are really good. And the people that are affiliated with the CMT centers of excellence, they know CMT. Mm -hmm. I had a physical therapist after my first surgery said, well, you're trying to build your calves up. Just when you're thinking about you have spare moment, go over to a set of stairs and put your the, the, the ball of your foot on the edge of the stair and just drop down and do some heel raises. And you've got to be kidding me. I'm here because I can't do that. You know, where's the CMT clinic? You can go to them and say, oh, these are sort of exercise. They've helped me adapt my exercise program. I would encourage people to go to them because they they will help you with your toolkit. Yeah. I think he's, he's yeah. Account, like I have mild symptoms, but I sometimes wonder if I do because I take such careful care of my legs, make sure they're aligned and they've got the right support for the circumstances, which is tedious. It's so tedious. Well, I also think the stretching program helps a lot. I think people just give up on stretching. They're like, well, my toes are going to do this anyway, so why stretch them? Yeah, you could talk to the the physical therapist there, and they could give you the exercises they give to people when they've had a surgery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's how you could start, because you can start really small. And that's going to improve your outlook. I mean, you're going to feel better. Even a little bit of activity is really a wondrous thing. Yeah. Of, of demeanor and, and how you feel. And I know that may be the home runs. I'm not, I'm not discounting that for some people because I know this is something I've learned like about 1A, these different types. Uh, I heard the, the, the podcast with, with Maddie the other day. Yeah. A terrible 4C. Like, oh my God. So I don't want to be the guy flashing the home run sign and like, you're not judgmental or criticizing people. You have to work within your limitations, but they can, can I help you with that? You got to talk to the right people. Thank you so much. You're just a wealth of information. A lot of this stuff is in your blog, your website. Well, I have publications on my website, some of which are in the CMT report. Okay. My branch leader talking about maybe posting things about uh, exercise on the CMT, you know, site or whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. About doing Definitely. that because I want to make people mad. Like it's like, oh, you've got these guys just coming and telling us what we can't do, but it still might help people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I yeah, agree. Absolutely. There's always a way I mean, to do that. People yeah, would benefit from that knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. We so have you a couple just, fun questions for you. Are we ready for those questions, Chris, or oh, did okay. you have another question? Yeah, no, I, I we can we can go to those fun questions and then we'll wrap it up. I did well, let me just back up. Go ahead. So Jeff was commenting on a lot of things. And I guess in closing, Jeff, before we get to the fun questions, what advice do you have for the CMTA community? In summary, kind of Yeah. Someone well, listening to this podcast, what what would you like to say? Well, I would say get on the blogs right? And follow those because they're oftentimes fun. Like people will post really fun things. And the questions people ask might be really relevant for you. I know as a teacher, I tell my students, like when you ask a question, you're doing other people a favor because they may not be, have. they may be too shy to ask the question. They may feel like it's stupid to ask the question, or they may not be able to formulate it properly. But there's people out there that will really help you with your own problems, I think, and have great ideas. Uh, And then also work within your limitations to be just a little bit more active because it it, it does do a lot for your attitude. And then you, over time, you might, you might find that you can really do a little bit more. Just find yourself because I know that they have enormous challenges. I mean, it's really overwhelming sometimes. Thank you so much for that insight. I am looking at something here. Lizzo loves these fun questions, and I'm okay. actually laughing myself here. <laughs> but I will let her ask the first no, one. No, go ahead. You ask them. You ask No, I it. think it's so creative. You got it. Oh. It's awesome. Go ahead, Lizzo. <laughs> Would you prefer to walk around with broccoli for your arms or a salad for your head? <laughs> um. Wow. I, I don't think, even know how you come up with that. That's good. I think I would say salad for my head because I would be eating a little bit of it at the time because I really love salad. Okay, good. All right. And if you could be a tree, what tree would you be? Oh, I think I would be the banyan tree, the trees, the tree of lives that come down and they put the roots into the ground. Because I, I feel like, you know, this the Hindus believe that reality is three quarters spirit and one quarter matter. And I think we are, there is this kind of, I mean, this is not an evangelical thing, but like there's this kind of spiritual dimension to life. And I think the tree kind of symbolizes that. that the, the roots come down from the sky and go into the ground and then nice. step everything up. So, yeah. That's cool. That's Sweet. great. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Lizzo, <laughs> those are like fantastic. I'm looking at like a salad head. No, well, I just, <laughs> these type of fun questions, I'm going to tell you, will we'll come out in every episode now. I like it. I really like it. So, Lizzo. 
as we are running out of time here, if someone wants to follow us on social media, where do they go, sis? Well, we do have a Facebook page. We have more and more followers, which is great. It's CMT for me podcast. So follow us and all the updates and get great tips for living with CMT, celebrate Catterday with us, meet members of the community. It's so much fun. And we also have an Instagram page or whatever you call it, Instagram thing, CMT for me podcast. All right, cool. And what happens if one of our listeners today has a story? Oh my gosh, please write us. So we have a form on the CMT website. So you say cool. CMT for me and you can pull that up. Or also you can reach out to us on PodPage. So it's our website, www.podpage.com backslash or just slash CMT for me. Cool. And I'll okay. have that in the, in the show notes. All right. And also folks, don't forget to leave us a stellar review so we can reach more individuals in one way to leave a review is to go to Apple Podcasts or go to Pod's page. Is that right? Pod page. Leave a review there, folks. <laughs> All right. Namaste, my brother and Jeff. Namaste. <laughs> Thanks, so Lizzo. Thank you so much, Jeff. Bye-bye, folks. Until hey, next man. time. Hey.